Thank you very much indeed, uh, my good friend. And um, I would like to thank the Edwards Laboratories for having allowed me to participate in this interesting uh, symposium and actually apparently speak about old stuff. But it's not old stuff, it's an update. I think there is a place for the Swangian scatter, but most opinion leaders agree, but of course not for everybody, and we use them less often than uh, a few decades ago. But we need to consider a gradation in our monitoring systems. We don't need the most invasive form of monitoring in every single individual. But here, in a recent consensus meeting on the perioperative management of the high-risk surgical patient, as you can see, we considered a number of monitoring techniques and we would not want to eliminate any. We would rather try to find a place for all of them, including in most severe cases, the pulmonary artery catheter. Now, of course, echocardiography has changed our lives. We don't need to be experts. We just need to be able to manage simply. And with these developments, and I am a big defender of echocardiographic techniques, but with this development, we still need sometimes invasive forms of hemodynamic monitoring. In this paper, which I wrote six years ago already, uh, the title was, we use less pulmonary artery catheters, but why? And among the most important reasons I listed, the PA catheter was overused in the past, no doubt about this. And there is a more widespread use of echocardiography. Yes, indeed. So that has changed our lives. And actually, if you are not using echocardiography, come to Brussels in November, and we will show you how to do it with the experts, the world experts from Australia, from the US, from Europe, and we transmit images from our department to an auditorium like this one so that we can interact with the experts at the bedside. Nevertheless, echocardiography does not bring the entire information. It doesn't tell you much about SVO2. It doesn't tell us so easily about a number of hemodynamic variables. And usually, it is not continuous. In the future, it may be continuous, but not now. So we still need both. Of course, we need to be less invasive, no doubt about this. But today, in 2017, I'm afraid to say that we are still sometimes invasive. We still insert arterial catheters in patients who are in shock. We still insert central venous catheters in many patients. And if you read the latest guidelines, on the management of septic shock in children. Invasive hemodynamic monitoring should be considered. Monitoring filling pressures can be helpful. Observation of little change in the central venous pressure during fluid administration encourages you to continue. Observation that increasing CVP is met by a reduction in the gradient between the mean arterial pressure and CVP would actually suggest that too much fluid have already been given. Last month or two months ago, in children, small patients in whom uh, inserting a catheter may be more a challenge than in our adult patients for most of us. Now, when I was resident, we inserted the Swan catheter right away. We did not have the echocardiographic techniques widely available. And when the patient was coming in, oh, hey, hey, he's very sick, oh, <laughs> inserting the Swan catheter. <laughs> Actually, now we keep it for a bit later. 
When the situation is complex, when the patient is not improving quickly, when the patient develops ARDS, when we don't know how much fluid we should give, whether we should give more inotropes, more dobutamine, what do you think? That's exactly what we recommended a couple of years ago with this society. We wrote, in complex patients, we suggest to additionally use the PA catheter, and we suggest pulmonary catheterization in patients with refractory shock and right ventricular dysfunction. So, and there was no discussion about this around the table. None of us, we were about 15 around the table, none of us said, wow, well, do you think we should say that? No, 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 there was clearly a consensus. And the nice thing about the PA catheter is that it brings you information on pressures, on flow, and SVO2 all together. If you look only at one of these three elements, you may not have the complete picture. But the problem is that if you try to avoid it, we must be less invasive, you use only the CVP, it doesn't tell you much about the left side at cardiac filling pressures. You use your favorite technique for cardiac output measurements, may not be so reliable. You want to measure the SVO2, but you use the SCVO2, that's a crude approximation. So you add approximations to approximations to approximations. What we wrote here in this other recent consensus meeting on update on hemodynamic monitoring, we wrote that a particular hemodynamic monitoring technique cannot by itself influence outcome. But, you know, I'm concerned about the fact that there are many people who measure cardiac output and then they are very happy to measure it, but they don't do anything with it. Oh, a cardiac output is six liters per minute, so it's good. Or it's 3.8. Not very good. What do you mean? Perhaps when you say it's good, it's not high enough. When you say perhaps the patient was just anesthetized and is mechanically ventilated with a low oxygen demand. As I said at other sessions, cardiac output, it's a little bit like the speed of your car. 120 kilometers per hour, ah, oh, that's good. Well, no, not if you are in the center of Vienna. And uh, likewise, if you're on the freeway at 40 kilometers per hour, that's indeed not very good. So that's the most important element. If we measure something, but if it does not influence management, and if it does influence management, we must make sure that what we decided here improves the patient's status. So if you just measure a cardiac output by your favorite technique, you may not have the full picture. And we may actually like to have very short responses, as now with the new technology, which is proposed by Edwards, to have a fast response cardiac output monitor to look at changes in cardiac output during passive leg raising or a very short fluid challenge. Cardiac output without SVO2, SVO2 without cardiac output, difficult to interpret. And actually what our doctors like when we discuss all this is the return to physiology. Because this old stuff, old stuff. But it shows us the relationship between left-sided, right-sided filling pressures and the pulmonary artery circulation in between. When I ask some young students or young doctors now, how do you interpret this? A right atrial pressure of 12 and a left atrial pressure of 8. You know what they sometimes say? They sometimes say, I don't know, but we don't know this one, Gans catheter. The physiology remains the physiology, my friend. How can you treat a patient if you do not understand the abnormalities? So think about the heart that you could perhaps open so that you have the right side at the left side because we usually go from left to right when we follow the blood. And so if all cardiac filling pressures are increased. It may mean global heart failure. It may mean hypervolemia, tamponade. But if the CVP is higher than the central left-sided filling pressures, it could be that there is a gradient between the diastolic and the pulmonary artery balloon occluded pressure, something that you can evaluate easily, very easily. 
with a pulmonary artery catheter. Of course you can do it with echocardiography. Again, okay, okay, okay. But you can do it here routinely and continuously. Now I sometimes hear people you know, sitting down and say, ah, the patient has a heart rate of 125 per minute. Should I give a better blocking agent? Wait a minute, the physiology is like this. That's my interpretation of a fast heart rate. <laughs> Don't give beta blocking agents to pay all patients with tachycardia. Please try to think a little bit about the underlying pathophysiologic phenomenon. Oh, wait a minute. You know, this guy is speaking about what is the evidence based medicine. <laughs> Has the use of the Swangans catheter been associated with better outcomes? <laughs> no. <laughs> but look at the protocol which was used in these studies. Typically, when the physician felt that he or she needed a Swangans catheter, he could do it. It's only when she or she, he or she was saying, well, I don't know, okay, <laughs> that these patients were randomized. Of course, nobody wanted to really look at the data obtained. But going back to my previous slide, if you want to improve outcome, you need to change management, and the management must be associated with an improved outcome. So if you agree that the swan gun catheter is not associated with better outcomes, then we need to think, is it because we didn't change treatment? Then of course we shouldn't use it. Or is it because we changed treatment but it didn't help the patient. So it means that you know, we should not give more fluids, we should not give inotropic agents, etc., to critically ill patients who are in real trouble. It's actually, it makes us think. Have you seen other studies with other monitoring techniques? Well, we reviewed it a number of years ago, and we found that for pulse oximetry, you can find a large study, most of you know that, a large study of 30,000 patients monitored with pulse oximetry or not. No difference in outcome. No, 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 no. I gave a talk earlier on the risks of maintaining SpO2 at 100%. Do we have evidence that chest x-rays improve outcomes? Ah, yes, gastric telemetry, yes, yes. This old study published in the Lancet, looking at intragastric mucosal pH. Many of you do not know what this is. <laughs> but when you measure it, you can reduce mortality rate. How many of you use gastric telemetry? Nobody, because it's no longer available. <laughs> it improves survival, but we don't use it. So <clears throat> we could go on. You can go on with PICO, LITCO, whatever, trans, uh, bioreactants, whatever you like. EKG, do you want to do a study on EKG? We could, we could actually do a study on EKG. I asked my statistician how many patients we should enroll to show that EKG could improve outcomes, and he told me 10,464. We could ask the Australians because they can, they can easily uh, enroll 10,000 patients in one year, but that study will be negative. And then everybody will say, oh, we learned that we should not do an EKG because they do not reduce mortality rate. How do you want an EKG to really decrease mortality rate in a large patient population? So I'm not sure that we need a prospective randomized control trial on everything. I think the physiology is important. And you and I, we have all learned that combining variables is actually helpful to understand what's going on with the patient. So for some, some of you who hardly use the swan gun catheter, it may become problematic when you decide once to use the swan gun, oh, oh, swan gun catheter. So I think we need to keep a minimum number actually to make sure that the teams are used to it. So I would encourage you to keep that minimum. What is that minimum? It depends on your environment. We can speak about it in private. But we need to keep the team comfortable with this. And then we could indeed treat the sickest patients, 
not overuse it. No, 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 no. Use it appropriately. And as I said, there are new developments that allow us now to have fast, very fast uh, changes in cardiac output identified with the monitoring system. So finally, yeah, if we look at big data, in the US, the number of swan gun skeletons has decreased, but since about 2009, for the last eight years, it has become quite stable. That's a very recent study, just published on June 7 of this year. And it's primarily in respiratory failure that it went down, but in heart failure, not so much. And if you look at this paper published in circulation last year, you can see that the number of swan gun skeletons is actually increasing somewhat in larger hospitals or in teaching hospitals. People realize that perhaps we have been too negative towards this yellow catheter. So, in closing, you will say, so what are the indications? Is it the patient with, I don't like to ask the question in that way. I prefer to ask the question the other way around. How will your measurement influence your therapy? If you tell me it may influence the amount of fluids you give, it may influence the way you give inotropic agents or, in, uh, or vasoconstrictors for the right height, right heart, etc., then I will say, yeah, that may be a good indication. I like my MIA rule. If you measure something, but if you don't interpret it, it won't help. Just measuring cardiac output for measuring cardiac output window will not help. If you interpret and if you don't apply, how could the patient benefit from it? So we need to have these different steps together. And if we do that, we should not overuse the swan gun catheter. I'm not proposing to go back to the past or anything like that, but I think we can keep some love <laughs> for the swan. Thank you very much.